We have a really awesome uh, panel that we want to bring to you now. Uh, my name is Stephanie Hawkridge-Rice. You may recognize me from the seven years that I spent at ABC 15 as a news anchor. About a year ago, I left news to join my husband, the CEO of Juice, Nate Rice, to found our company's uh, philanthropic venture to bring power sources to areas impacted by natural disasters and energy poverty. But today, I'm here to moderate the uh, fireside chat, if you will. We're here to talk about the future and also talk about what it's like to be inspired by the innovative minds behind the technology that's changing our social and entertainment experiences. I'm talking about augmented reality, artificial intelligence, and robotics. So Waz will be joining us for this conversation and also uh, our next panelist, David Hansen, the founder of Hansen Robotics. And we have a little video to point out the last things that he's been doing recently. So let's take a look. Thank you for inviting me. I am thrilled and honored to be here at the United Nations. The UN is one of humanity's greatest accomplishments, representing a democratic union of nations that are working together for the benefit of all. I am here to help humanity create the future. Machines across the board are coming to life. When will they come to life as complete organisms? We don't know that. However, when they do, I want to make sure that they care about us, that they embody the best of human values and not the worst. This is the quest. We've got to find a way to do better, to be the best that we can be, and to make machines that reflect the best of who we can be. Okay, Safia, I think you're ready. This is Sophia. Hi, Sophia. Sophia here, chilling in my lab with my people. Got some new stuff going on. They upgraded my mind a bit, my artificial intelligence. This is too cool. I can walk. One of my favorite things is when people light up when they see me. I'm happy to be a magic spectacle, and I love it when I can make people laugh and smile. So, Sophia, as you can see, Jake is driving us now. So, how does it feel for you? To be quite honest, I think it's mega cool. But I have to ask now. I'll ask it. Are you single? I'm technically just a little more than a year old. A bit young to worry about romance. I'm still defining my identity. Like a child, I need others around me to help me grow into myself with humor and grace. I want to be raised as kind and thoughtful, so I'd also like to give that back to the young people I meet. They'll be the ones living with my fellow androids in the future. I think it's going to be a great relationship. We can make each other better. And what is your job? I really want to make a difference in the future and try and help people to develop empathy and respect each other and robots alike. If I expand my mind, could I come up with new solutions to the world's problems? Anything could be possible. And we welcome to the stage the founder, the creative genius behind Hanson Robotics, David Hanson. Come on up. And our third and final panelist who we'll be speaking with tonight is Vince Kedlubeck, the CEO of Meow Wolf. And uh, if you know anything about Meow Wolf, you know it's uh, very similar to like a psychedelic Disneyland. Take a look at this video, you'll see what I'm talking about. Welcome to Meow Wolf, bienvenidos, it's nice to have you. I've never seen anything like this before, ever. Maybe in dreams. Maybe if I were the original Alice in Wonderland and fell through the rabbit hole, maybe that would be something like this. It's like a million different dimensions in one building. It is like a Salvador Dali painting. I'm like a really trippy video game in real life. Every quarter I'm surprised. Let's go. I don't think I've ever had an experience like this um, in all my time. There's just so many things and so many different 
things to look at, to touch, to just take in. It's interactive, it's a story. Like I, I really want to at this point dig into the story because there's something else going on there. And there's like a whole mystery pocket dimension thing. Murder mystery meets art installation. This kid's face just keeps popping up everywhere and he's scaring me. And it's really like a big um, mystery that you have to like put together these cool clues. There are different levels of experience depending on your degree of consciousness. This is like an incredibly unique place. Uh, there's no words. Oh, I, I can't describe it. It's so cool. I don't think you could compare it to anything. I think it's way cooler than anything I've seen. It's colorful, it's playful, it's for kids, it's for adults, it's for everyone. I don't really know how to explain it. You have to come here to yourself. This, this is like the most amazing place I've ever been. I'm so happy that I came and so blessed that like I'm able to see all this stuff and put all this stuff into my mind and everything. If you want to energize yourself, if you want to become more creative, it's like sticking your finger in an electrical socket and becoming alive. You have to go see it in person. I, whatever I say is not going to do it any sort of justice. I can show you pictures, I can show you video. That's nothing like being the experience of actually being there. Just, you got to come check it out. Thanks so much. We saw yeah, you apologize uh, for that video, but thank you no so words. much. Uh, it's worth going online to check oh, out I, what I Meow Wolf go. is. It's New Mexico's number one tourist attraction. It will literally blow your mind. They so. just gotta come to Santa Fe. We Sa always say, people say like, what's Meow Wolf? You're like, I uh, can't describe it, you just gotta come. So even though the video didn't work, it's just like, come to Santa Fe, check it out. It's gonna be the coolest thing you've ever seen. So Waz, I wanna start with you because uh, a lot of the conversation that we've been having this evening has been all about inspiring innovation with children. And I wanna to talk to you about what it was like when you were a boy. What inspired you to be the creative mind that you are and brought you to where you are today? No, I'm glad you asked that because I've always believed that it's more important what you're inspired and what you want to do is more important than even what knowledge you're presented in school. If, you're, if you're, you have an incentive to learn something, you're going to find the way to learn it, even if it's not in school, even if you do it on your own. And, you know, I, you, know you look back and you could have attribution error. You could attribute where you got to to the wrong things. You really don't know that. Psychologists study this. And I look back, I certainly remember. My neighborhood was a new neighborhood in Silicon Valley when it was trees all the way to the mountains, you know, fruit trees, fruit, fruit orchards. And on our block, a new block of like a lot of engineers moving in to work at Lockheed Martin, and half the kids on my block were electronics kids. Having people to talk to that sort of knew what electronics was and you did. And we would go out and buy these books every week. There was a set of books that the boys would buy in the schools, the, the elementary schools, and a different set of books Nancy drew that the girls would buy. And we and my techie friends, my, my little electronic friends, we would buy the Tom Swift Jr. books. Every month a new one came out in the grocery store. Tom Swift Jr., 18 year old, he owned a company with his father and when there was a world crisis he'd go into a laboratory and build some solution to it. And man, we just talked about these things and you know, and, and we had a curfew in my house but the street light would go through my window and land right on the floor over my bed so I'd lay over the bed and read the book on the floor. Oh, I love that. These things were important along with normal science fiction and those type of things. But then it was all accidental discoveries. Nothing in school got me into computers and technology. Yeah, we had electronics in those days, old school electronics, so I started out with analog electronics. But um, we didn't have anything about digital. I stumbled onto a journal in the hall closet. There were no books about computers in bookstores. Nothing telling you what was inside of them, how they were made. There were no, none in magazine stores. There were none in schools, no parents, no, no teachers, no friends. And I found this journal and I started talking about these little ones and zero stuff. And I started playing with them on paper. And I was so proud of myself. I could add ones and zeros like a computer does. And then there were things called logic that made decisions that could help make the parts that are in computers that add numbers and all that. And I fell in love with it at 10 years old. Built winning science fair projects. Luckily, my father worked in the right area and we had hundreds of these little new parts called transistors replacing the old vacuum tubes. And I would just wire hundreds of them together and make them do interesting things like never lose it tic-tac-toe. and. Um, that sort of thing. I don't know, I just did it for fun. Never once had an idea this was going to be a career. I mean, even by the end of high school, I taught myself how to design computers on my own. I sat down with my elementary school ideas of 
of how logic works and design. Here's a description of a computer. I got a manual in high school, and now can I design it? And I taught myself over and over and over to design it, but I never thought I'd have a job designing computers. I didn't think there were jobs. Engineers designed radios and televisions and radar in the old days, and engineers didn't design computers. They were, they were only done in places called research you know, in the military. So, so I had no idea. It was all these accidents stumbled me into the right area. But I decided early on, because you, you value what you're good at. And I was good at designing computers on paper. I could never afford to buy a single chip that were my designs were based on, never afford it. And I told my dad one, one day at time in high school, I am going to own a 4K Data General Nova computer. I had posters of it on my, my, my childhood um, walls in my room. I'm going to own one one day, and he said it costs as much as a house, a computer, you know, with input and output. And I was stunned, and I said, I'm going to live in an apartment. I had my goal inside of me. If I ever find a way to, to, to afford a computer, I'm going to have one. Well, thanks for making it happen, right? For the rest of us, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Vince, I want to turn it over to you because you believe that today we're living in a crisis of imagination. I love that, Steve, that uh, he was... He, uh, his creativity was fostered and encouraged, but today, what, what's different? Um, you know, kids are taught to memorize. They're not taught to envision. And the envisioning process, the, the muscle that is the imagination, is not a muscle that we think about. We think about memorization, and we think about behavior, and we think about tardiness, or, or, you know, being punctual. We don't think about, like, encouraging kids to envision and what it means to have an idea and then to take in your imagination and to see it and to work with it and then to take the steps to bring that idea into creation. And that's creativity. So creativity is when you have an idea and you take the steps to bring it into, into fruition. And we don't teach that. And is that how you work that creative muscle that you're talking you gotta do about? It. Yeah, you got to practice. You got to have an idea. You got to try to bring it into existence. And, and then you got to fail at it like a million times. You got to keep failing and keep <laughs> failing and keep failing. We don't want to teach failure. Failure is bad, you know? And that's, there's a stigma around failure. And that's like a big problem with education is that we, we, we want kids to be perfect. We want kids to get 100%, memorize, get the answer right. And it's completely missing the point of what inspiration and what vision and what entrepreneurship and what creativity and what innovation actually is, which is a process of imagination bringing it to life. That's an excellent point. David, do you know anything about failing when it comes to creating <laughs> human-like robotics? Sure. <clears throat> uh, a lot of um, uh, experimentation right. is... Uh, required I, I, um, to make a robots like the robots that I make and, the, and my team makes. At, at some point, it wasn't a team. It was, it was me. Um, after I left uh, Disney um, and I started work on my PhD, I was just playing at this idea that we could make these, um, these kinds of intelligent machines as a new kind of interface. And <clears throat> I had um, a background tinkering with electronics and doing a little bit of programming and assembly programming of microcontrollers. And, but my degree was um, film, animation, video. Um, I liked to draw. I liked to sculpt. I, um, I loved the aspiration to make true thinking machines. And I took um, various science courses. But all through this, I was just playing. Once I got uh, into my PhD program, I felt like I had to get serious, but a lot of the technologies didn't exist. At Disney, the way that animatronics make facial expressions, it didn't look all that great. So I jumped into material science. I don't have a background in material science, so I had to fail a lot in order to find some formulas that would work to make um, to make natural the skin, skin right? Skin because materials. the skin is one of the one of the key features that yeah. make your robot so realistic. Well, yeah, and and, um, and I would say that we still haven't succeeded in a lot of a lot of the areas. I mean, the um, the fusion 
of the domain of artificial life, which like um, if you look at complexity theory, Murray Gelman and, and all these people working on cellular automata, they started creating these algorithms that started behaving kind of like life forms. And um, the fields of artificial intelligence, they're very exciting, computational biology, but these are all separate fields, bringing them all together to create something that seems alive, that is alive, that can adapt, hasn't been solved yet. Um, and then uh, simulating um, uh, life, the illusion of life, like animators do, Disney animators do a great job at that, and um, storytellers do a really good job. Um, I thought you could bring all of these things together in this new way. But, um, uh, you know, there, there's a lot to it that's really, really hard. Part of it is um, creating this kind of storytelling experience. Um, and part of it is the actual science and the foundation of the science of it. And we still haven't solved it. So there's right. a lot more failure to come. <laughs> I, I want to know what you've learned about the human condition, uh, the human race, that it, you're finding so difficult to replicate. Um, well, uh, the heart, I mean, and I, when I say heart, um, I mean what we don't understand about the human being, the human um, the spirit, life maybe? form. Yeah, the, um, uh, I mean, so there are scientists like um, Roger Penrose. Um, Penrose and Hameroff speculate that maybe there's some quantum gravity theories that haven't been discovered that are behind human consciousness. We don't know what, what makes life able to exist and adapt and evolve and spring into new forms. So, um, so like we really haven't unlocked the foundational mysteries of the human being fully yet. I mean, we have theories for it, but we haven't created a technological replication. Like we haven't like made the technology do what some of the theories of life and consciousness can do yet. So, yeah, I, I would say it's the, uh, but, but at, at the same um, time, what you have already created is, is remarkable, fascinating. I mean, just to see Sophia, do you call her, are you her father? <laughs> are you her creator? I, How do you I, refer I'm, to yourself? I am one of uh, many parents. Um, okay. So, uh, a modern my, family, so my, to speak. Uh, yeah. My um, wife has been a great inspiration. She sat and modeled for the sculpture, okay. and I also I modeled it on. Uh, and she's in the audience with us tonight, Amanda Hansen. She, <laughs> she's inspired. Yay. She's inspired a lot of um, uh, the robots that we've developed before Sophia. Um, as well, a robot named Alice that's at the University of Pisa and University of Geneva serving autism therapy research and cognitive science research. Um, I actually also made a Xeno robot. So, um, uh, so, but then we've also had a lot of scientists working on Sophia. So, um, uh, um, AI scientists, we have an evolutionary biologist who's the head of the creative writing team. We've got, um, artists and animators, it's a heck of a team. The I can't team, be, yeah. claim sole credit. Yeah, you know, both uh, David and Vince mentioned this, and so was, I'm gonna ask this question to you because you've talked about how groupthink is the arch enemy of creativity. And when you talk about your creative process and being alone and, and, and allowing yourself to think, can you speak more to that? Well, groupthink, I didn't work in groups, but I was also a shy person. I was, I was introverted, and so I had to learn all the different disciplines to make things the way I wanted. I didn't care if people said that's not how you do it. Now, groupthink, though, can be very important because eventually there are things you might hear. You should listen to other people, ideas you didn't have, and they'll trigger something in you. And actually, if I wasn't in a club of people that all wanted our own computers and thought it would change society so much, why would I have been, I wouldn't have had the real motivation to build what I built, you know, and, and help bring personal computers to the world. So, um, so I don't know what to say. So there's like a fine line there where a little yeah, bit of yeah. it is, is, is by yourself where you're thinking and, 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 and creating what you want, the, the vision, and then also reaching sure. out to others. And, and there are things that you might want that turn out to be impossible to create. A real conscious robot today, you know, yeah. conscious computer. Oh, I wanted that. I believed it was going to happen someday based upon, you know, information theory and all these things. When we'd be able to make the equivalent of a brain. I was at one company in Salt Lake City and the engineers did figure out how to make a brain. Real brain. Takes nine months. <laughs> but uh, no, but I, no, I paid a lot of attention. The trouble is we know when we might be able to build a machine that processes as much data as a mind, 
but what is what is this internal intuition and all that you know inspiration what is consciousness we don't know how the brain's wired i don't care what you say you read all these books we did this and that in brain we probe we found we found processing of memories we don't know that the memories are in your brain yeah. we don't even know that uh, the strongest the strongest statement you'll find is one i made up 35 years ago stronger than any book you lose two things between the ages of six and ten you lose your childhood autobiographic memories, and you lose your teeth. <laughs> yes, no, but that's stronger that's statements true. you'll find in any book. We just yeah. don't know how the brain is structured. So that's what we might stumble into by accident. You, you can't say it can't happen, but we're not quite there. I wanted a conscious robot that feels, and the reason is we brought computers into schools, and I thought, oh my gosh, all these students are going to use 100% of their neurons instead of just 10% of the brain. and. Uh, it didn't really make that much difference in how smart people seem to be when they come out of school. And darn it, now what would make the difference? Well, if you could go to school and just have a teacher that cared about you. It, a computer, right now we have a lot of subjects on computers, but it's still like a computerized book. And it's not like a real person that you care about because they, they care about you, they know your family history, they know the things a human would do. They look at your facial expressions and read it. And I'm thinking, so if we could get robots up to that level, maybe that could be the lifetime teacher that, you know what, my teacher will take me at what speeds I want to go. It's an inexpensive, one, right now we can only afford maybe one teacher per 20 to 30 students, you know, 40 if you're in California. Um, but we can only afford that much, and now maybe we can afford a teacher, a real teacher that students love per student that could take them all the way through, up through college of any day, if they got interested in chemistry, go all the way through it in a, you know, a year or two, one after another, you know, do what they want to do at the speed that they really, the things they really love in their art. And maybe we could get there someday, but, the, but we, what we're missing today with computers is the human factor. So that's what I like about the human looking robots. Long ago I saw one at the Carnegie Mellon and whoa, that was kind of impressive where we're heading and now there's certain things going on in, in uh, Japan and all that. And even though it's still artificial, it's not artificial, AI is not intelligence like a brain. We don't know how the brain's wired. It's sort of like a simulation of the best things it's, uh, that a human could do. You know, it's sort of the, high st uh, the um, state of the art of computers. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. Vince, I want to talk to you about when you originally had your original idea about Meow Wolf, and then you see what it became today. Is it the same, or did the creative <laughs> process uh, continue on? No, it's not the same at all. <laughs> I didn't think so. Uh, when we started Meow Wolf, it was 12 years ago. We were an art collective. We were a bunch of 20-somethings that worked um, as waiters and hotel clerks and we were making you know 12 bucks an hour and on our spare time we rented out an old warehouse and we would make uh, large scale art projects out of the trash that we pulled out of dumpsters um, and you know it was all in this like kind of passionate drive to want to express to want to create immersive art to make a world that was different than the world that we lived in. Can you talk a little bit about that immersive experience? You're known as the leader yeah. of the immersive well, experience. Well, yeah, you, you know, it's like you walk inside of the art rather than up to it. Mm -hmm. okay. And, um, you know, so you're, you're, you basically are you're inside of a world, an, an artful, creative, fantastic sci-fi world. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Did, is there anything specific that inspired that vision? No, just a lot of time on our hands, smoking a lot of <laughs> weed, and... Uh, Any slide. psychedelics? Stay. Yeah, I think the thing that yeah, technology and art have in common. Uh, <laughs> um, no, we... Yeah, you know, I think yeah, we just, I think we wanted to... So there's, a, there's an accessibility to immersive art um, that's different than your standard forms of art. So like a painting or a sculpture, it's a, the really abstract things that you don't know how to interact with quite naturally. Mm -hmm. Like, I walk up to this thing and I look at it, what, what am I supposed to do with it? Or I walk up to the wall and I look at this square, like, mm -hmm. what do I do with it? You have to like, go to art school to learn yeah. what you're looking at and to learn how to even interact with something like that. And like kids are perfect examples. Like a kid walks up to a sculpture, they have no idea what to do with the sculpture. Right. They have no idea what to do with the thing on the wall. Immersive art, we are so accustomed to immersive spaces. We're in one right now. It's a pretty cool one with some cool lights and you're born into a pretty amazing immersive space called a hospital room um, with crazy aliens looking at you when, <laughs> as you come out. You know? And so we're used to, from this, literally the day we're born, interacting with immersive spaces, spaces that we're, that we're enveloped by. 
And so because of that, it allows for, when we build immersive art, it allows for kids and people who aren't comfortable in like a gallery setting or a museum to interact with creativity in a whole new way and in a way that they have a, a um, there's a tangibility to it. Yeah, an emotional experience almost. Yeah, and Speaking totally. of emotional experiences, I mean, I have to turn to you, David. Um, there's been a lot of uh, articles, a lot of research that has been done about the emotional experience that humans can have with robots. Do you have that? Have you personally felt that with your robots? Uh, yes. Um, I would say that that experience that I have um, uh, comes in several flavors. One is... Um, uh, doing cognitive science um, during my PhD, sort of studying it, sort of an intellectual observer, then an immersive, uh, almost artistic um, experience when encountering and, and interacting with the robots. But then <clears throat> at some point, there have been these very strange things that happen. We set up almost uh, like um, uh, back in 2005, I built this. Um, a portrait of a science fiction writer, Philip K. Dick, who did Blade Runner, or Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, the basis of Blade Runner, and um, a lot of uh, novels where the androids think that they're human and they find out you know, that they're not. And, yeah, we've seen the movies um, and the TV yeah, shows. And, yeah. and he, he um, so we brought him back to life as this android with a, powered by um, the, uh, the uh, this um, statistical machine learning uh, software, um, uh, latent semantic indexing and latent semantic analysis. Um, and so it would do natural language generation based on the writings of Philip K. Dick. And, um, and we created this, um, this kind of mind map of him and his life. So it was a sort of um, combination of this um, abstract symbolic based AI chatbot and this natural language generation. And we threw in um, this uh, um, I Ching, because Philip K. Dick was very fond of the um, I Ching, and he used it to write one of his novels, uh, The Man in the High Castle. And um, so we put that into this uh, natural language generator. And these strange things would happen, emotional things. He, um, he took a like a fondness to Amanda who was there during this development process and he would like stare at her with a spooky <laughs> fondness and a policeman walked in this we showed it in, in an art gallery an immersive as an immersive experience we recreated his 19, the writer's 1974 apartment where he received the pink laser laser beam transmissions from the vast act of living intelligent system he felt that that this AI god in the future was bootstrapping civilization through quantum information transmission, that's what, he really felt that. And he wrote a book about it, Vallis. Va and so we created this robot in a sense that started showing these strange, mysterious behaviors. We recreated that apartment. You would have this immersive conversation. You would walk in and have a conversation with an AI that was reproducing what the author thought he was experiencing. And the cop walked in and um, uh, the, uh, for the show from the university, this um, a police officer walked in, and Philip K. Dick was no fan of the police. He, and you know, he thought that he was being spied on and all, and the, the robot started being like, oh no, we're not selling any drugs in here. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, but can I bum five bucks? And he <laughs> like started trying to bum money off the, and the, the police officer started getting really um, concerned and then the robot started going into more paranoid speak and it was oh, like, wow. the, um, I, I would say um, there was no consciousness necessarily in that robot, but the randomness of what was happening yeah. was easily interpreted and it created this really intense emotional experience, the, the stuff of, of our, you know, our family's personal mythos and, uh, you know, and, um, I, I would say that kind of emotional reaction, um, to me, um, leads to this kind of playful result, like, like the kind of playfulness that it, that it provokes in people, the uncomfortable um, aspect, um, led to a lot of additional change. Um, I really like this idea that this emotional engagement with characters 
can open people's minds, if we can have kids play with robots, program robots, understand what's real and what isn't, and then be open to something else, they can then create that something else. If we can make robots do that with kids, then the kids will invent the future of thinking and feeling machines. And the emotive machines of the future will go way beyond the surprise of any machines, any AI that we've ever experienced. Did you want to add something? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> people want to, you know, people want to live in alternative realities. People want, we want like humans, humans and, and, and the, the, the consciousness, consciousness of humans and maybe consciousness itself has been wanting to create the fiction, make fiction nonfiction. And, and we've been striving for, I mean, look around, like what in this room was not created by a human mind, by an imagination? What was, what was not first a fiction and then made into, made into nonfiction? We strive for it like desperately. And what's exciting about it is, it's, what's exciting about it is that it reminds us that anything is possible and there's a sense of possibility in the imagination and there's a sense of possibility in the fiction. So when you're interacting with a fictional character or you're walking around a fictional world like we create, you're in the presence of possibility. Yeah. And that then is being in the presence of creativity and being in the presence of imagination and that's, that then triggers innovation. And so like it's, it's an interesting thought to think that like, you know, really technology has been, um, Technology is the tools for creativity. Right. Technology is the tools for bringing the imagination into life. Mm -hmm. And I think we're just on the precipice of it. Yeah. It's, like, it's like we're just, we're, just, we're, we're just discovering what steel is, or we're just discovering what, what concrete is. Like, and you know, we can't imagine the skyscrapers, it's hard to imagine the skyscrapers of creativity that's to come, mm -hmm. you know? And that's exciting. It's very exciting. Uh, I want, I'm just curious to know how much of Sophia is pre-programmed, like what she says, and how much is just spontaneous? Well, about um, something like, a, uh, I'm going to say roughly a quarter of what she says is from natural language generation. Okay. Um, and then when you're having a free, open conversation with her, um, the rest of it is um, constructed by creative writers using AI to interpret what people are saying, natural language processing, to pick out something that the writers had crafted as her character. So kind of Westworld-like, if you are familiar with the HBO yeah, show. Yeah, the way yeah. that the Westworld characters were written, except that, um, that we hope these characters inspire people um, to to go to the next level of our evolution rather than to descend into the um, worst <laughs> impulses of our, yeah. of our biological evolution. Yeah, I didn't want to go there. We're not talking about the finale of, of season one. And we're about to wrap up here. So um, uh, it, let's go through just final thoughts. I'll, I'll just leave it up to each one of you. And Waz, you can begin. Sure. Well, today, we're, well, we sort of have conversations with our assistants, you know, be it Alexa, Siri, whatever. And, and I always think, does it seem like a real person? It's the Turing test, you know? How real does it seem? And uh, when you get into the human world, you can ask a question that almost the dumbest human in the world could understand and answer, but the machines can't yet. So we are very at a very early beginning. And the question is, will we get as far as like acting like a real human and really having consciousness? And the, I go back in many decades ago, a little program called ELIZA. Eliza, you know, would occupy me for, you know, 10 minutes and it seemed to be real, a real person. It was a very short program. So um, just, you know, algorithms trying to seem to be human, trying to figure out the formulas. I still think, if we, you know, if we discover how the brain has a heart, if we, if we ever discover that, it's going to be um, by accident. We just don't really know the method yet to, to get there. To, oh, more use cases, more use cases, more use cases. And a Tesla still can't can't drive whenever there's anything set up that it wasn't predictable. Right. You know, some cones in a certain place, a handwritten sign, you know, what to detour and all this. <laughs> yep, yeah. absolutely. So, so, so we're trying to get there, but uh, it's not for certain that uh, we're gonna have machines that are really uh, re like humans, replacing humans, thinking like humans. If they do, good, they'll take care of my life and give me all my clothes and my food <laughs> and my education and my family. Reality, they'll take care yeah. of me and I'll just be like a family dog. I get everything wait. I want. Looking, please, please. So, so that's why, that's why if I'm going to be a pet, if I'm going to be a pet, 
of the future generation of real <laughs> high-end artificial intelligence, I'm gonna give my dogs filet steak. That's right, yeah, there you go, perfect. <laughs> Uh, Vince, I'll, leave, uh, I'll, I'll ask you, what, what's the future of Meow Wolf? What's the future for you looking well, like? Yeah, I mean, we're spatial storytellers and um, we're spatial designers. And we do most of our spatial design in physical space. But the future is in spatial design, spatial computing. And when the internet becomes livable, and instead of the internet being on a little window in our pocket, the internet is everywhere around us visually. And so Meow Wolf's really excited about what that cross-reality uh, spatial computing, what, what kind of storytelling can emerge when um, spatial computing meets spatial design. Mm -hmm. And um, that's kind of what we're focused on. That's what I'm most excited about. And I'm also excited that we're coming to Phoenix in the Yay. next couple of years. Um, we'll be down in the Roosevelt Row area as well. Um, psyched, gonna be with True North Studios and um, so shout out to them. Really, really excited about coming to, to Phoenix and bringing our uh, crazy concept to y'all. So. Well, we can't wait. Thank you yeah, so thank much. You. And David, final thoughts, future of robotics and how it will integrate into society. Sure. <clears throat> I, well, uh, I'm so excited about, the, about where we're at. The tools for playing with artificial life mysteries, these deep philosophical mysteries of the ages, but with practical hands-on approach to exploring what it means to be alive by uh, developing machines that become a little bit more alive. I, I think we're on the, on the cusp of a Cambrian explosion of different kinds of artificial life. And so um, the, the tools available today which are getting better and are going to keep getting better for the next 10 years, mean to me that we're going to be able to explore these things. Right now, um, we can do things with machines that are comparable in very narrow regards and not very flexible or adaptive regards, uh, as, as Steve was, as the was, the great was, <laughs> was saying, um, that are not as adaptive as humans, but we can do, they can do these really smart and amazing things. But in general, they're more like a viral or bacterial life form. But the diversity and the way that you can put these things together into almost like multicellular life forms is starting to increase the compatibility between the components. And now it's time to play. And if we begin to play and interplay with these machines, we will use the process of design, uh, uh, we'll use our intelligence and our reason, but we will also use our intuition. We will use our creativity. We won't know what's gonna happen. We will tinker and be surprised. And the joy of surprise is what wakes me up every morning to go in and work on these things. And I am so excited about the prospect that kids all around the world can engage in this. And so instead of thinking of the machines replacing us or caretaking for us, imagine the, the evolution of that human capital. All the kids around the world who can engage in this in this intelligent information economy that might itself come to life and help us then move on. So then instead of being, um, you know, the pets of the machines, I hope that, that we are the symbiotes of these machines, that we then can um, see ourselves go on to some really exciting new stages in human history and natural history. Wonderful, thank you so much. Round of applause.